All right. Everyone had a good lunch? Let's get started. Definitely not just because I wanted an excuse to jam us to work today. Why are you still here? Do the intro. All right, there we go. So I think we all know these kind of scenes and these kind of videos with holographic presentations. And we have seen them in many science fiction movies. And in particular, one movie that kind of pioneered that in the 70s, which this video I've just shown was clearly inspired by. By the way, I took this video from a website called uh, Production Crate. They offer free and public domain uh, tutorials how you can implement or make, create those effects with post-production and visual effects tools. But today I'm actually going to show you how we made that a real reality with 3D holographic streaming, 3D volumetric video capture streaming. But first of all, welcome to the talk and welcome also to the visualization and science communication track here at the ASA. Uh, my name is Rene. I'm Director of Global Innovation at Valorum Reply, and we've been working with mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, whatever reality you want to choose since many years, and in particular with, and in particular with this one, the Microsoft HoloLens, since 2015-ish, and developed lots of custom applications and <coughs> products for clients. Right now, I'm focusing with my team on a solution we call HoloBeam, which allows these kind of 3D volumetric video streaming I hinted at. But first, let me tell you why this is actually relevant for space science and space travel. So you probably have seen some of those videos with Mars stations, or this is the moon base. And well, you know, space travel and these kind of uh, travel in the future is definitely not just a challenge from an engineering standpoint, like how can we actually get there, the engines and so on, but also uh, communication is a huge problem, right? Because if you're just isolated on, on your own, right, you get cra crazy, you get mad, right? And that's definitely something you want to avoid, especially if you're that far away out. So what we have available is, of course, text communication, audio, video, video chat. But we are humans, right? We live in 3D. We see objects in three dimensions. So seeing the other person in three dimensions and seeing that fully immersive communication scenarios, of course, of course, much more realistic and, of course, much more deeply connecting. And that's why we developed that solution I'm going to show you. By the way, this is a video from the ASA for the Moon Village project, right? And so the moon is not that far away, but still, you cannot just hop on a plane and be with your loved ones in a couple of hours, right? That just won't work. So having this rich, immersive communication method uh, will become much more relevant. But we don't have to go that far out. If we look at the ASA and all the member states and the different facilities located all across Europe, um, of course, you know, this communication is also relevant for these kind of scenarios where you have multinational organizations that, you know, not, not just want to leverage video chat, but actually 3D video chat, plus also collaboration. So what we also allow is collaborating with 3D models so you can share CAD files and CAD files and collaborate with those. Or if you look at Earth observation, these huge amounts of data, very dense data sets, right? And bringing those into these remote collaboration settings can be, of course, very much uh, beneficial. This is what we have currently state of the art. Um, what you will see with virtual reality, these kind of avatars, right? That's what you see often these days these kind of comically, I took this one from Altspace VR, but there are other platforms where you see this kind of comically representation of the other person, which of course doesn't look like the actual person. And of course for entertainment and your gaming scenarios, this is, this is very good, but you know, for professional use cases, you actually want to see the other person and you want to see this deeply emotional connections, like you know, is the person smiling and mimics and hands and so on and so forth, right? Well, what we actually want is of course this, Right? That's what we really want. We want to beam and transport. And there's this another nice science fiction series uh, that showed that in the 70s. Well, if that will become reality, I don't know. I know there are some experiments where they transported photons and whatnot, but who knows? But then again, you know, Star, uh, Star Trek actually pioneered also the communicator and look what we all have our own pockets today. So who knows? I don't know. By the way, I took this photo in one of Microsoft's buildings. Um, it's on, on a Redmond campus. I think it's Studio D. It's a super nice art piece. 
So you can see it's actually ma made out of um, spools of frets. So not a fret pool, fret spools. And yeah, super nice op piece. But then again, you know, we cannot have beaming, but maybe we can have at least holographic beaming. And that's what we developed with our solution called Holobeam. And to take a look, that's what we can do. We basically can real-time stream 3D volumetric video. And that's actually me beaming into the New York City store of Microsoft in real time, just from Germany. So how does it work? Well, we're leveraging adaptive streaming. So we just require 5 Mbit bandwidth for all of that. And we can go even lower because of adaptive streaming allowing us to um, uh, you know, adapt, the band, uh, adapt the quality based on the bandwidth. So here's how it works. Again, we use the HoloLens, like this device, as, a, as our main viewing device, where you can see the uh, other person as a hologram, as a virtual object, right? But we're also working on support for other platforms. And by the way, you see the gentleman here. He's wearing um, an accessoire that you can buy. It's basically, you can attach a hot hat to it, which is pretty nice. And this these, uh, visor is actually uh, certified as security glasses. So you can even use it in some uh, environments, like construction site and so on and so forth, right? So again, how do we do it? You might see on the left side, there is this 3D camera that's actually just a Kinect V2, you might know from the Xbox One. Uh, but we can also use other depth cameras, but this one is providing still very good quality. So we take the data from that sensor, which provides us not just color information, but also the depth data, right? Basically the distance to each pixel. Then we take the data and packaged it up in a certain format we invented that allows us to get it pretty small and compress it without having actually a lot of decompression artifacts on the viewing side. Because if we would just apply your typical video MPEG compression with block compression, you would end up, for example, that the hand is behind you or whatever, right? So you would ha face these issues. So that's why we um, um, made this custom kind of encoding. And then we stream that over WebRTC. WebRTC is an open source protocol, an open source implementation as well of this protocol, uh, web real-time communication. And if you want to do something like that, like live video chat, live video transmission, definitely look into WebRTC. That's, that's the, the best you can use these days. Like I mentioned, adaptive streaming, meaning you know, if, the, if the bandwidth is lower than 5 Mbit, the quality would be degraded. And in fact, just last week, I was at the Gartner Symposium in Barcelona, and they had an IT expo there, so we were also showing our solution on site. And on one day, I was pretty brave. I just used my mobile phone as a hotspot. And we had a call with my colleague in India, right? And in that setting, with all the other vendors, like thousands of Wi-Fi signals and conflicting signals. And it was probably below one Mbit what I got there, but it still worked. You could still see the other person in 3D. Of course, degraded quality, right? But you could still use that. And uh, it was the, the interactions and all of that were still working fine. But yeah, I understand even for space communication, one Mbit is quite a bit challenging these days, right? But there's a lot of progress being made with uh, you know, relay stations that would relay the signals or laser transmission or whatnot. I mean, this needs to be solved anyway if space travel should become a reality. The communication challenge and the bandwidth needs to be increased. But we can also, of course, record those messages. We can uh, play them back like you can see here in this video. Welcome to the new Holobeam, now in full HD. Holobeam is a telepresence application that allows you to capture and stream. We render that real content. time, as you can see, One, so we one. can adapt the visual Check style based on your famous and Google most favorite science fiction movie. We can have different styles. Um, and it's all rendered real time Holobeam on this mobile HD. device, on the HoloLens, right? Holobeam Which is quite is a, a challenge because it has a tiny processing. And I'm going to explain a little bit in a minute about the device. But yeah, we do that with custom shaders. If you're not familiar with it, a shader is basically a little program that runs on a graphics processor. Welcome and to the new that's Holobeam. how we can now get the speed. We're actually using geometry shader Holobeam to emit those points directly. And also the video, video decompression is done directly on the point. GPU. So we're really pushing it to its limits. From well, let's, let me talk about uh, the HoloLens for a little bit. And you might actually have seen it. It was in space already with Scott Kelly in 2016. <laughs> Do you say you can see us? Oh, my God. <laughs> In February 2016, Scott Kelly successfully checked out the Sidekick application by making the first Skype call from the space station to Mission Control. Well, next time you should use Holobeam. Uh, 
But anyway, let me just spend a minute on this. Um, I guess most of you actually know it already, but for those who don't, let's make sure we're all on the same page. So this is the device, bunch of sensors, as you can see here, lots of cameras built in that actually provide the data for the, the positional tracking. And it also has an IMU built in, inertial measurement unit for the head rotation. So it basically has full six DOF tracking without any external sensors, right? So it's fully six DOF inside out tracking, which is pretty mind blowing. Um, also depth sensor built in here, so it can measure the distance to object, which you can then use for like physics interactions or occlusion. Think about like you have a virtual object and you put this behind this table, right? Then this real table could occlude this virtual object, of course. Uh, what else? A um, bunch of microphones, microphone array for speech recognition. These tiny speakers here, they are pretty uh, impressive because they provide you spatial sound. So you can actually hear the sound where it's coming from and you can actually locate it when you hear it, right? So you, you will immediately turn your head where you can hear the sound. And of course, uh, these transparent lenses, like you can see, these are actually waveguides, those displays, and they allow you to project virtual content on top of the real world. And it's fully self-contained, so all the processing is done on the device. So as you can see, there's a custom motherboard in here and a coprocessor, Microsoft calls the holographic processing unit, which is the HPU that does all of that, you know, real-time uh, spatial reconstruction, all of that stuff on this chip. So basically, that's how they get the speed. They build custom silicon for that. And it runs Windows 10, so you can even have some Windows 10 universal Windows platform applications running on it. And then you have the batteries back here, two to three hours battery life, which is pretty impressive if you ask me for what it does. All right, let me show you another nice video from, from the solution Holobeam we developed. Because uh, in the title it says we cannot just stream objects, and not just stream persons, but also objects. So as you noticed, we kind of cut out the person, so kind of an automatic green screening. But we could also disable that, and we could send the whole view of what the sensor sees, right? But on top of that, we could also bring in 3D content. And here's probably another scene you have seen in science fiction movies. Holographic chess, but for real. And yeah, my colleague in the US, I'm in Germany, no perceptible delay. If you look closely, you see that it's really a, at the same time moving, and all of that just with 5 MBit. And we can bring in the Earth, so think about like here at the ASA with all the data you have, and you know you want to have a collaboration setting uh, session with one of your colleagues in a di different office. Uh, you could actually bring that data in and visualize it on top, right? And discuss it, and we also synchronize the camera space of the both sides, so when you actually point at something and a 3D object, you as a virtual hologram, right? it will actually be there. But right now we require special hardware, like this depth camera I've shown you, right? You can see it standing there on a tripod. Um, but we're also working on a solution where we want to get rid of that using a deep learning model for depth estimation. So how does it work? Basically, we take a training data set that was captured with the Kinect, in fact. So we have the color input plus the depth input, right? Then we train this neural network with it. And after that, it can estimate the depth just purely on the color input, right? Here's a little demo video. On the top right, you can see the, the color data there. And first of all, the, there's a deep learning model that does the segmentation. So we just have the person isolated, right? And then we can also estimate the depth. You can see the gray uh, on the bottom right there. And yeah, in the middle, you see a kind of 3D rendering on top of that. There's still uh, a lot of to, to tune there, like uh, the hyperparameters and training data sets, of course, are very important. So there's still some ways to go. Um, also processing hungry quite a bit. So at the moment, we're getting like 15 frames per second on an NVIDIA 1080, which is quite a beefy machine. But if you saw some of the sessions this morning from NVIDIA, I mean, they have like new stuff coming out that will increase, especially inference, right? the inference will get much, much faster. So it's just a matter of time. And I think it will happen sooner than we thought that we maybe don't need them anymore um, for many scenarios, right? So we will still need depth cameras, of course, first of all, for generating the um, uh, training data. But then again, also, you will never get the precision, right? You will never get the precision just from this deep learning model, especially on if you want to get it real time on uh, most hardware you have available these days. Just think about we as humans, right? If you close one eye, you just have monoscopic view, you can still estimate the depth, right? You still know where the stuff is, but if you have two eyes, stereoscopic vision, it works much better and much more precise. So that applies here as well. And yeah, AI and mixed reality is not just for these kind of depth estimation, but here's another project I'm working on, which is using uh, real-time or near real-time object recognition 
using a newer API called Windows Machine Learning, which allows us to run deep learning models on the device directly with the inference directly on the device. And we don't have to like make a call to a, a cloud service or something like that. Now here's a little video. So that runs on the whole lens basically. I just put it on, I deployed that model. And yeah, take a look. This might be a car wheel 3.5 meter in front of you. Right, so it also outputs the distance. I'm just using the spatial mapping distance from the whole lens from the depth sensor, right? This might be a matchstick 1.1 meter in front of you. And actually, there's a newer version with a latest update. They got this is the likely a minibus 3.1 meter in front of you. It even runs GPU accelerated. So it's like four or five times This faster. is likely a Volkswagen Multivan Generation 6 3.2 meter in front of you. It's just a squeeze net model, just a deep learning, uh, pretty compact model, right? That I trained with an image net database that I modified a little this bit. This is likely a car mirror 96 stuff. centimeter in front of you. Well, now think about like Astro Alex or other folks, right? Deployed in space, they have an accident, they actually need to do like some this sort might of procedures be a hammer, very fast, right? They centimeter can put in front on this of you. device and then it will tell them what they need to do, right? This is likely a Black and Decker power drill 82 centimeter in front. Because in the end, it's all about enabling the people, right? It's all about enabling the people to be, well, superhumans, if you will, but actually getting more capabilities. But also, especially in a communication context, when we, when we think about, like, you know, people are the killer app, like uh, Charlie Fink, my friend, and Forbes Aldo wrote, that's really, uh, you know, the, that's the key. Like, if you look at all the social media and the, the social networks, I mean, that's one of these things, like, communication is key, because we're humans, we're not robots, right? We want to communicate with each other. Um, here's another outlook. So if we look at the current devices, like, like the whole lens, some might call it bulky, but again, I'm still impressed like after using it for three years that you know what it can achieve in this form factor already. I have never thought like five years ago that this thing would be a reality. Um, but of course, you know, there are all other smaller headsets. It's all current active development. Uh, one of the major competitors uh, for Microsoft HoloLens is, for example, Magic Leap, the ML1. It's a really nice form factor, super light head-mounted device because they do all the processing on a battery belt pack. So you put it here, the heavy stuff, and the, the HMD, the head-mounted device, is much lighter. But what we want in the end is this kind of stuff, right? I mean, that's the size we want, or contact lenses. Or for the really brave one, implants, maybe. I don't know. Not for me, but some people might enjoy that. I mean, that's Black Mirror right there, right? If you know that's serious. <laughs> anyway, I mean, in the end, we might don't need those kind of um, head-mounted devices anymore. Here's actually a video of um, some recent research from Brigham Young University. And you see they actually build a, a, a particle trap that tracks a particle, and then they can uh, change it and move the position. And then they're basically shooting laser rays on top of it. And they can even have uh, colored rays. It's pretty cool. Of course, that's way, way out, so it takes still quite a bit, I can imagine, until this is something we, we can expect to use. But it's definitely great progress, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. And in general, I mean, it's an awesome time to be alive, right? It's, it's really, we see science fiction technology becoming reality, right? That's, that's what we have these days, so that's, yeah. I'm still blown away, like I said, it's like, the, especially also when we talk about AI and deep learning, the progress that is happening the last two years or so, it's mind blowing. Anyway, thanks for your attention. That was my presentation. Also on Friday, I will be here in the, the Phi Lab for a little presentation which goes a bit more in depth. We will also probably do some demos there of some other projects we're working on. Um, so it's at nine on Friday, if you're still around, come by. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, we have like two minutes left, and also you can see my email and then my Twitter handle, you can connect there or LinkedIn or whatever uh, and reach out if you want. Yep, and please stay. We have an awesome list of uh, presentations upcoming. So yeah, with that, thanks a lot, first of all. Well, let me take a really quick a 360 with you guys. Oh yeah, take the mic. Uh, without actually, so um, the first application that comes to mind is web conferencing, teleconferencing, that you don't have to go 
here anymore, so we can save some uh, plane fuel. That's um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so then the question that I have is, what about standards? So my, I mean, this is now a Microsoft product, this uh, HoloLens. So what, mm -hmm. what if uh, ESA is using this system and we at university use another system? Yeah. How can we communicate on a mutual basis? Are there some open standards? Yeah, there's uh, actually very good progress happening with the OpenXR standard, which is also led by the Kronos Group. And actually, all the major like players in that field are, are part of that. So you know, it's it's typically with these kind of technology that first you know you have those independent players, but then they somehow find an open standard. And yeah, hopefully, I'm I'm a big advocate of that. So I, I hope that will happen rather sooner or later. All right. Anything else? No. Okay. So this is the actually a schedule for today. So we now have uh, Monsart, which who's um, presenting about Sammy. So give her a big hand and uh, yeah. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Montserrat Vignol uh, Sole, and I uh, work at uh, ESTEC uh, in the Netherlands uh, in the system support uh, division, so in the Earth Observation Department. So I will just put this red. Right. And uh, we um, develop a set of applications, and today I will be uh, talking about SAMI. So um, in the context of the um, Earth observation uh, for ESA, there was a, a gap for applications that were uh, realistic in, in terms of the satellite model, but that they were uh, also flexible enough for the user to be able to uh, interact with the scene and make uh, generate, for example, some media content like a, like a video, a high definition video for a presentation. Or, or, uh, so, so there was a gap, and some is uh, an, an, an attempt, uh, I think, a successful attempt to um, to fill this gap. So today um, I will be covering the following. Uh, uh, what's what is Sami? Um, why we need Sami, which is the name of the of the application. Um, then I just quickly go through the support and missions and uh, a bit how the application looks like, and uh, give some examples of uses, which are uh, which I will be going um, uh, through, and finally how. To, no, um, how to get it. So, um, as you can see, SAMI is a, an application which is uh, freely available and that displays uh, high definition uh, 2D and 3D scenarios of ESA Earth observation satellites. Um, as you can see in this, in this image, the, uh, you can observe the, the realistic way in which the graphical representation is made, also showing sun illumination, the effect on the model, the shadowing. And then this application can be run uh, both as real time, so uh, synchronized with the current time, or in a kind of simulation mode, which means um, you can set the time to the past or to the future, so it's fully flexible. Um, why SAMI? Uh, as you can see, there is a, a need to, to display, uh, to visualize satellite, uh, a satellite, how a satellite looks like, and how the environment affects this, this satellite. So you can see the classical uh, approach you know, on, the, on the left, and it's, the success depends a lot on your, let's say, drawing skills. So here it's quite su successful, I think. But if you are not that, uh, that artistic, then uh, SAM is a good thing because it um, allows to see the satellite model in a very um, realistic way, as you can observe in the uh, video. And you can see also the um, interaction with the other elements of the scene because you need to 
uh, display, uh, for example, the solar array rotation, how it moves uh, along the orbit. You can uh, display also this, uh, if you have an instrument on board which is observing a, a given region, so the swath, the one is overpassing a ground station. All this can be uh, easily uh, visualized. Um, okay, support emissions, we have uh, all the Sentinel family. So that's um, uh, all the models uh, and also the predefined uh, um, projects, we call it, so that you just start the application, select the mission, and, and that's it. It's, it's configured. Um, also for the Earth explorers, we have them all. Um, what we have on the pipeline are the, the ones in, in orange, which is Sentinel-6 and the MetaPG AMB models. And then we have something called the DAMI uh, satellite, which is um, for is giving the, the user a way to uh, represent a mission, which is not ESA. For example, you want to see the A train from Const Constellation from NASA, or you can um, set the, um, a project with all the, all the satellites. And at least you will be able to see them. Um, maybe the model is not representative because it's just a dummy, but you can represent uh, the interaction with the, with the, on the Earth and an interaction between them on the 3D uh, Earth, so, which is also interesting. For example, um, this is one example. Uh, here is one of the first uh, use cases you can think of um, to display where the, satellite, uh, where the satellites are. So you can see them all together. Uh, in real time, or uh, which is more interesting, you can have several views, several cameras. Uh, so you have here a 2D view of the of the satellites. Here uh, you can uh, switch from satellite to satellite. So uh, you have an uh, here is, it's representing the sentinels. This is useful, for example, for display in a uh, in a control room for public uh, uh, relations, uh, or you can even show it to your family if you want to explain what you are doing. Uh, at, at work. Then, uh, this one is, a, is an interesting uh, example for, for uh, engineers because sometimes they have, uh, you observe a strange thing on, on, on the telemetry and you want to see, okay, what happened at this time? So you go back, you can stop the scene, you can rotate the model, see where, for example, the shadows are, the sun, where is the sun coming from? So you can add a visual aid for, for the sun direction. I think it will appear, yeah, all right. So. And you can check the angle from uh, illumination. That's uh, a useful use case. Uh, another one is uh, okay um, is to generate uh, media content, so screenshots or uh, high definition video. And for that, um, you can, for example, display uh, the solar array uh, deployment or a given maneuver, as it is in this example. And this is uh, useful if you want to explain to colleagues what is the effect of one, of, of, of one maneuver. In this case, it's a collision avoidance maneuver. So the spacecraft is rotated to thrust. And you will see little uh, uh, plumes uh, for, for the thrusters. And then uh, it, it goes back. S another use case is um, it's very um, useful. Uh, is to understand um, dynamics between, between satellites, because uh, now it's very um, fashionable to talk about tandem and constellations, but what happens when you put them all together, uh, you can see very easily the interaction between them. So for example, in the first case, you have the Sentinel-5P and you have uh, SWAMI, MPP, and they are flying together, and the swath of one of the instruments, of, of, of uh, Sentinel-5P is inside the one for SWAMI, and this is the intention, so that's good. And for the other case, you can see the two satellites, which uh, one is Earthcare, the other one is Terra. Earthcare is not even there, so you can, but you can still have the uh, simulated. So you can see uh, how is the dynamics between them, how they um, change with time, etc. So I will. I've more or less covered a bit uh, examples of use cases, and now let's talk about the application itself. This is the um, software aspects. We go quickly. We are reusing things because we like to reuse existing toolkits. So the main graphical toolkit is Unity uh, game engine. And for the orbit and the swaths and the moon and the sun calculations, we use uh, with 
software libraries called the Earth Observation CFI, which are also uh, developed in our um, uh, section. Uh, we have um, about platforms. Well, uh, this application runs on, on Mac, runs on, on Windows, and it's also available for, for iPad. Um, how does it look like? Uh, well, the application is, is, is fairly simple, and, and then there is a, a very, um, um, the, the application menu can be summoned, but it typically it's quite empty, so you only see the earth. And then you have, uh, you can uh, have the menu and the time control, which are the main components, because you want to see the, the, the earth, and you want to control it, uh, the speed, the, um, and in case um, you can just select a project and uh, display it for a mission. But if you want to change some settings and you want to play with it, uh, it's, then you can um, uh, drag the timeline editor, which you see on the, on the right, uh, extended for a, for a given example. And you see all the time blocks, which you can add and delete, so you can uh, um, enable, disable, swath, stations, or change the camera view. Okay, uh, finally, uh, it's, uh, this is another member of the family which is coming. It, this is a bit more for engineers, satellite engineers. So, uh, But this is, again, um, uh, we can see that if you have a bit of an artist on yourself, you can do something like on the left to understand the components. Um, but uh, if not, uh, we have developed an iPad application, which is... Um, showing the various, so, so you can explode the view of the spacecraft and look inside at the different uh, parts. And the intention is to uh, display um, tel telemetry data, typically, like uh, it could be a temperature or voltage associated to a given uh, unit on the spacecraft. Uh, so here you see that the various, um, I've selected, uh, there is a subset of, of, of units selected, and you can see information uh, associated to the measurements. And uh, this application is also available on the, on the App Store, so uh, it has some uh, dummy data to, to, to play. And it's one uh, member of the family, which, which we hope to keep, um, uh, hope it evolves. Um, Next, okay, just uh, how to get it. So it's um, it's on the web and on our website, and we have an email address in case you have questions or suggestions. And that's it. We have time for questions. Any questions? Any any questions from the audience? And there we go. <coughs> First of all, I want to say it's a very interesting application, and especially for educators like me, I think this will come in handy. And I have one more yeah, question about the 3D models of the satellites, mm -hmm. because I've often wondering, been wondering where can I get my hands on the 3D models itself to use it in animations. Is there a way to kind of download them, to import them? In well, the, the 3D models are, to, are, the, are together with the application, but it's a kind of custom uh, model, enhanced to work in a way that is very, very crisp and very, how to say, uh, performant. So I, I'm not sure how reusable they are. I mean, the models are there. If you are a, uni a Unity uh, master, maybe you can uh, use I guess them. they are available in some no, kind of... There is no public, uh, let's say, uh, interface for, for, for the reuse of the, of the models. Okay. But they are not the developed to be distributed. Uh, okay. But maybe just simplified versions of those could be, yes, could be nice. So there's, uh, there's a problem of uh, usage rights in the end. Or? Uh, yeah, 
Yes, yeah, it is a problem of user right. I mean, if okay. there is a request for having the models also made available for mm -hmm. to general public, I think we need to investigate what's the intellectual, intellectual property right, what is the, the implication. I but, would say uh, that's, but I, think I request it. Yeah, <laughs> or, already now, I mean, all the output of the application can be used by, by all yeah. the users, yeah, the, both the videos and the screenshots. Yeah, but I can already think of a lot of situations where you want to visualize something very different that is maybe not possible uh, here. It's understood, the, it's understood. That's yeah. a good point. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for this uh, amazing presentation. I really love that you're actually also using the Unity game engine, which is not a game engine anymore, right? It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, very impressive. All right, next one is uh, Bruno. Is Bruno here? Yeah, there he is. Bruno, your stage. And Bruno is going to uh, talk about high dimensional data visualization through virtual reality. And when he showed me his slides earlier, uh, he actually has a, a really nice live demo. So I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> Take a look. Yeah, hello. Welcome Bruno. <laughs> thanks. Hello. Um, yeah, where we'll be talking, we'll be showing these demos. It's about squeezing as many dimensions as we can using some technology from virtual reality. So let me first introduce myself. I am Bruno, interactive programmer, digital artist. So apart from doing my own artistic work, mostly oriented to interactive art, I my job is to create tools that allow artists to create more te technical stuff and also to how technicians to create, to give uh, their own work look better. So for example, I've been lately developing this. This is a uh, hardware software framework to create um, human motion capture suits. You can check it out at the site, but this is not the theme of this uh, presentation. This, the theme is data visualization, and data visualization is about discovering regularity on empirical data. And I would say that data visual, a good data visualization is one that allows the user to intuitively discover those patterns. So it's really important when choosing the, the type of a presentation for a particular set of data to just pick the correct uh, representation. So let me go back in time <laughs> a little too far to show you some of the history of uh, data visualization. This is William Playfair. He did this in, in 1785. And in, on the right hand, we have a current line chart created by a computer. So keeping in mind the fact that William did this with just ink, pen, and he didn't even have a calculator, it makes you think that we can do better. So, uh, don't get me wrong, it's like uh, the, the, the right one is a perfect chart. If that's what you need, this is nothing wrong with it, but if you're talking about visualizing high dimensional data, or at least many dimensions in a single visualization, we should try to use another type of tools. For example, several years later, what uh, William Playfair did, appeared this other tool, this other visualization tool. I think most of you already know it, it's the scatterplot. And it was great because it was a much more flexible tool uh, to start with, it allows to, out of the box, visualize at least two dimensions, and it has a very remarkable characteristic. It's like you can, in your mind, or in, in a piece of paper, you can fit a curve and uh, intuitively predict uh, what that the data is talking to you. Of course, uh, this, time of, this type of representation can be expanded. You can easily add another axis and, for example, color code the, the dots and you get a four-dimensional visualization. But there might be some problems with this procedure. I, let me do an experiment. I will show you a shape. I, I, think, I think that the shape I will show you is well known for most of you, at least for some of you. Please raise your, hand, raise your hands if you recognize this shape, the one on the right. No hands? Okay, let, let's do an experiment. Let me show you, you know, this exact shape, but in an environment that allows me to rotate it. Now, what is recognizing the shape? Okay, it's a hyperbolic paraboloid. I think most of you, but the important thing here is that when we, we project 
a three-dimensional shape in a 2D surface, we are losing something. I, I think some people, some few <laughs> coming from art of observation really know about what a projection means, and you're always losing something when you do a projection. So let me go back to this previous shape and show you something. I said that by color coding the dots, you get another dimension, really. But if you carefully see at this particular visualization, you get to see that the color coding is redundant with the seat axis. So you don't really get another dimension in this particular visualization. You are just putting color there because otherwise it would be really hard to see where every single point is on space. So these sort of problems are derived from the fact that we have to project uh, 3D spaces on 2D surfaces. So why, the, the question might arise, why would I want to project a 3D sp uh, space in a 2D surface? The answer is simple. It's like we don't have other choice. If you look at the interfaces humanity has created to communicate stuff, you get to see that most of, the, uh, most of them are bidimensional. Just, for example, take a look at the computer monitors where we do most of our visualizations. It's a two-dimensional surface. The paper is, of course, two-dimensional. The, the, the type of uh, supports that humanity used before paper are also two-dimensional. Bidimensional, excuse me. Uh, and if you pay attention to the input interfaces, the keyboard and the mouse, what we usually have in a computer, they are also two-dimensional -dimension, input interfaces. And that brings me to the uh, virtual reality headset. One might feel like this headset is a higher dimensional tool, but if you see at how it's implementing, what Rene also showed about the HoloLens, it's just, about, it's just a couple of two screens in front of, uh, of the user eyes. And what it makes feel, makes feel, makes like it's, excuse me, makes feel like this is a high dimensional tool is the fact that the content displayed in front of the user eyes is changing in a smart manner. It's changing accordingly to the rotation of the head. So that makes the user feel like he's, he's inside a three dimensional space. So, okay, we end up with this. It's a well-known problem in, in visual communication. We can all agree that the, the human mind can imagine or can represent no more than three dimensions, so we are stuck in there. And in addition, we have this, this new information that the, these three-dimensional um, representations we, will always be filtered, uh, projected in a bidimensional surface. So we have to find ways to tackle this problem. There is, of course, the traditional way. It's like just falling back to a set of bidimensional representations. For example, in the, in the visualization on the left, we get to see that the data is forming some kind of a curvy surface, but it's hard to tell where exactly on space it is. We can use the, the matrix on the right, but we, just by looking at the matrix, uh, the the intuitive feeling of the data is lost. You don't get to see anymore that curvy surface. As, as a proposal, we, had, we can use some technology borrowed from the video game, video game industry to, to that in particular, we can use the augmented reality, which is a branch of virtual reality, to put 3D objects on every, in our everyday space. I brought, I brought you some demos, excuse me. I have to go like this. So in order to see these demos, you will need a marker, okay? Can, can you do it? So you can access You can access the same, see if you can deliver, them. you can access them right now, it's there online, you can take a picture, a picture of, the, of the QR code with your mobile phone and you access this same, represent, this same uh, visualization. So, uh, let me show you, I'm just using a regular webcam, it's just no, nothing more, no required, no special hardware is required. 
Okay, and the first thing you might notice about this type of visualization is that you can treat the visualization as you will treat any object in real life. You can rotate it, okay? If you want to see a particular point of view, you just put it there. There is no more uh, intermediate 2D interface to deal with. You just treat it as you would with any object. And in this particular visualization, we are just seeing a couple of seasons from the World Championship of the Formula One. In one dimension, we are seeing the, the starting position of the grid. In another dimension, the, the ending position of the race. In the vertical axis, what's happening? Oh, okay, thank you. In the vertical axis, we can see the, the fastest lap time. Um, what else? The diameter of the sphere are uh, the, the position on the ranking. So we had four continuous dimensions on here, and we can put also three more dis discrete dimensions, like for example, the name of the pilot. If you get closer, you can see the name of the pi each pilot. The color rep can represent the, the team of each pilot. And in addition, we can use a slider. Okay, we can use this slider to change the particular rays we are looking at. So that's seven dimensions. They are not millions, but you can you get to fit seven dimensions comfortably uh, coexisting together in this easy to see representation. What time do I have left? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Let me, let me quickly show you another one. Okay. As a disclaimer for this one, I'm trying to use a, a subject more relevant to the theme of this conference, but I'm not really familiar with what you people do with <laughs> Earth observation data, so I'm just stacking as many dimensions as I can here. So we start with, a, of course, a five-dimensional visualization, but that's just a regular image. We can add, for example, some differential vegetation index as an elevation. can see okay that, that index is working as an elevation we can also I choose just pick some random band for example the near infrared band I put it as a color overlay but that's not completely readable instead I can just for example made a blood detection technique and then display it as clusters on top of the surface and those clusters are also distance sensitive, so when you get closer with the telecamera, you get to see the level of clustering decreasing, and so on. So that's it for the demos. I don't have much more time, so I would like to say some words about the technology use. The, the best part of this is, is that the, there is no hardware required. No, the, the device required for accessing this, this type of visualization is already, are already on most people's pockets. It's really fast because it's working directly with the, with the GPU. It's work, working with a uh, protocol called, uh, uh, standard called WebGL. And in this particular demos, we're developing using 3JS, which is a wrapper for WebGL, and using A-Frame, which is a wrapper for writing 3JS in a more simple manner. And that's it. Uh, I think that virtual reality is, is not a magic bullet in the area of data visualization, but it does empower yeah. greatly the access, the intuitive access to three-dimensional data where many dimensions can coexist. That's it. Absolutely. Contacts there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bruno. Do you mind if you open the website again where uh, folks could actually open that? Right. Um, with the AR marker you just handed out? Here. Oh, no. This one? I think you also had it on a slide, but if that's the URL. Or there we go. This one. The URL? Yeah. So if you go there, basically you can run the demo with the marker, or you just got handed out with Web AR, which is pretty awesome. Um, well, any other question? Yeah, the mic. Just wait a second for the mic so everyone can hear you. Here's also a QR code that can be used to, to access this same page. There we go. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And um, what I was wondering, if you want to go more in the Earth observation direction, where we have also the time dimension and the spectral dimension and multi-sensor 
dimension and coming up with an idea that uh, lets you really explore these multidimensional data stream, a cube. To be honest, I, I haven't really focused this work on, on Earth observation. I was just experimenting with adding dimensions, and then I get a proposal to, <laughs> to come here, so I did this particular Earth observation example, but I, it's not in my plans. It's like if anyone wants to develop something like this, I'm really, uh, well, I, I think would love to collaborate. I think there's a good opportunity for some knowledge exchange between the yeah, two of you because, yeah. and do a nice collaboration on that because you have the knowledge about of observation, I guess. He has the knowledge about web AR, so there yeah. we go. Yeah, thank you so much, Bruno. Thank you. <laughs> All right. question. Yeah. Okay. Now it's uh, Alessandro. Uh, okay. Yeah, Alessandro, just need to copy your presentation over. Yeah, on the other <laughs> side, just unplug your webcam. I'll, uh, this is very, like this one. Copy in this folder, um, yes. and then you can run it from there, okay? Well, while we wait for Alessandro to copy his presentation, maybe there's another question for Bruno or for the uh, previous presenters. Yeah. And, all right. Oh, there we go. All right. Well, the stage is okay. yours. Welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, proud to present you the project of uh, some colleagues of mine. Uh, this is the project of a blog, uh, is a project of a uh, div divulgation uh, information coming from uh, uh, data acquired from uh, Copernicus uh, Sentinel uh, mission. Uh, it's uh, the story of uh, some friends that uh, love uh, their work, uh, that have a passion uh, for uh, their work, and uh, they have created this, uh, uh, this blog uh, in order to uh, stimulate not only uh, use expert users, but uh, for the divulgation of uh, uh, a lot of information coming from uh, uh, satellite uh, data. Uh, so uh, take note of the heart starts beating. And uh, this is uh, a, a very, very interesting uh, blog with uh, a particular structure. In fact, uh, you can find uh, for uh, uh, section uh, where uh, uh, there are uh, data uh, images uh, coming from the uh, Sentinel-1, 2, and 3 uh, uh, mission. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, images, a lot of products of uh, uh, interesting events, uh, some uh, particular also uh, violent uh, event. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is not only the present of this, uh, uh, of this data, there are also the uh, a sort of, of travel. In fact, uh, the data coming from the uh, satellites are used also to uh, tell story, in particular uh, story of uh, explorator. In fact, uh, uh, there is a second section where you can find uh, uh, the, the story of uh, the course of uh, James Cook, and uh, you can see uh, through images coming from uh, satellite uh, the, these particular uh, steps of this, uh, of this uh, travel. Um, there, are, uh, uh, there is a third section, very, very interesting third section, because uh, uh, there are not only uh, data coming from Copernicus uh, mission, but also from uh, third party mission and uh, uh, or for uh, particular uh, projects, uh, for example, Pandora instruments that are a ground-based instrument for the uh, air quality control. There are uh, so uh, information uh, data that uh, of uh, air quality, for example, in the uh, Roma areas. And finally, the, uh, for the fourth section of the blog is uh, 
uh, for uh, expert user uh, and uh, it's a, a, a particular section where uh, uh, my colleague uh, have developed some uh, application in order to elaborate, extract information coming from uh, this, uh, this data. And uh, uh, they share this knowledge, they want to uh, stimulate uh, user to, to use uh, this data and uh, uh, elaborate. Um, so uh, uh, there is the, the, the sharing of the, of the knowledge that is a, a, probably an important paradigm for the, uh, uh, the growth of knowledge. Uh, there are, uh, these, are, these are some examples uh, of uh, uh, data and uh, uh, events that uh, uh, they have uh, um, uh, elaborated, uh, for example, from the earthquake of Accumuli or uh, uh, the flood of Madagascar, the wind in Chad, uh, and so on. Um, you can uh, visit the blog, you can see a lot of uh, products uh, coming from different type of uh, instrument, uh, different level of uh, processing, and uh, it's very, very interesting from this point of view. And uh, this is uh, the, new, the new test, newest section. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, it's a, a very, very interesting uh, um, application because uh, 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 starting from the Sentinel-3 mission, that's its particular mission because uh, uh, thanks to the uh, swath of the instrument uh, and the fact that uh, is a constellation of uh, two satellites, uh, the, uh, there is the possibility to, uh, uh, there is a revisit cycle of some areas in uh, very few, few days. And uh, the, new, the new, newest uh, application is the uh, global mapping of the um, uh, uh, of the Earth, starting from the this data coming from uh, Sentinel-3 uh, data. In particular, uh, there is a possibility to show on the globe uh, some ge geophysical quantities, uh, and uh, uh, it's possible to navigate the globe, uh, in this, in inspect this uh, this data, and uh, this is possible thanks to the um, a particular uh, 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 work on a worldwide library that is an open source library uh, of, of NASA, but uh, opportunity uh, tailored for this uh, Sentinel-3 data, and uh, uh, it's uh, hosted by uh, the platform, uh, this inf infrastructure on the DIAS that uh, offer the possibility to access to this data. In particular, uh, if uh, you want to um, uh, know details about uh, Onda Diaz uh, infrastructure tomorrow, there will be a training section in uh, James Cook uh, room. Uh, these are uh, some examples of uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, global covering. In, in particular, uh, in the first uh, image, uh, you can see the global vegetation index. It is a uh, 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 dimensional, dimensionless index about the uh, amount of vegetation on the, on the, uh, on the, on the globe. Uh, these are uh, uh, monthly map, uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, data acquired by the, the, the Sentinel-3 instrument. Uh, this is the um, combination of different, product, of different products uh, during, the, during one month of, of data. Uh, typically, these are cloud-free um, uh, images that uh, are combined and uh, adapted on the, on, the, on the map. In the second uh, um, picture, you can see the chlorophyll index. That is uh, an estimation of the chlorophyll. And uh, it is uh, related to the first index. But in particular, uh, it's uh, also an index of the uh, health status of the uh, vegetation. Uh, it's uh, uh, quite intu intu intuitive uh, to see the green areas with uh, uh, more uh, vegetation with uh, uh, a good uh, status of health of uh, vegetation. 
These two uh, particular maps uh, are uh, related to the land domain of uh, Sentinel-3 because you know that uh, uh, Sentinel-3 uh, uh, um, um, produces data from uh, ground segment related to marine services and uh, land services. An example of uh, marine ser uh, services for, uh, is uh, the algal pigment concentration. For example, uh, it's uh, a measurement uh, uh, in the, um, of, um, of the amount of uh, um, uh, co algal concentration uh, in, in the sea, and it's an index of the status of the health of the sea. In particular, it's related to the cycle of uh, phytoplankton, and so it's uh, an index also of uh, the status of the ocean and uh, of the sea for the uh, oxygen uh, generation, for the uh, amount of uh, 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 marine resources in, uh, in the sea. And uh, another example, it's a combined uh, product uh, from land and marine services where you can see the total amount of uh, water vapor. Uh, you, uh, you can see the uh, blue area, the uh, highest concentration uh, of uh, uh, highest, highest values of water vapor. And uh, in particular, uh, it's very, very interesting, the areas of uh, Himalaya, where uh, you see uh, the, the, the effect uh, the, uh, related to the uh, uh, starting process of monsoon and uh, uh, where the index of uh, water uh, vapor is uh, lowest respect to the uh, around uh, area. Um, yes, um, it's uh, a very, very interesting uh, 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 site. It's an uh, interesting uh, blog because uh, there are uh, a lot of information, uh, I said, not only for expert users, but also for uh, 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 common user who wants to, to know something about the usage of uh, uh, data coming from, uh, from satellite. Uh, you can inspect a lot of phenomena uh, and uh, uh, the, the future is uh, the integration of uh, uh, the newest uh, Sentinel uh, mission, it's a fi uh, Sentinel 5P mission. It's a, a mission dedicated to the atmospheric uh, products. And the next step shall be the, uh, the uh, developing of a mobile application in order to access to some uh, of this data and uh, uh, see the updates of the, of the blog. Uh, these are some uh, um, information related to the uh, access point to the, to the blog on the Sentinel User Bulletin Board and also on the, the Onda Dias official uh, website that hosts the, some application of the, of the blog. And if you want to see and, uh, the blog, uh, this is the official link. And uh, uh, it's a good, very, very interesting work of people that love uh, their work and spend uh, free time to uh, elaborate uh, data uh, with uh, a lot of passion. Thank you. Very nice. Um, we have two minutes left. Actually, one minute now. Any questions? That's one. Is this also open to public to contribute with uh, what they find, what they see? Uh, I think it's possible to discuss this point with uh, uh, guys who work uh, on this. Uh, um, the answer is uh, probably yes, because uh, uh, there are uh, some contributors coming from uh, other missions. In particular, uh, the project was born uh, uh, from uh, Sentinel, uh, uh, elaborating uh, Sentinel uh, data. But uh, uh, in the, these uh, months, uh, in, uh, in these last uh, years, uh, uh, some people have contributed 
with uh, providing uh, uh, additional info or uh, other uh, studies coming from uh, other mission. Probably, for example, is uh, in another, uh, uh, another provider of, of data. Or Pandora Instruments is uh, another uh, concept. Uh, it's a ground-based uh, uh, infrastructure. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's possible. All right, thanks again. And uh, yeah, on to the next speaker, please. Benjamin, take the stage. And Benjamin is going to uh, tell us about the Earth Observation Time Series for a GQIS plugin to explore Earth Observation Time Series data. And he actually has a pretty uh, interesting presentation because he's not using PowerPoint. Um, But first, but I need to find While it. I actually <laughs> said that, right, of course, it's, <laughs> it's not open. Where did you put it? Um, no. Well, yeah, yeah it's, are you looking where you copied it? Feature AO? Yeah, day three. Uh, no, no, sorry, the other one. Not, not future EO, the other one. This one, day three. And the last one, visualization science. Oh, right. That's, that's a folder. Okay. Okay, and so here we are. Um, hello, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Benjamin from Humboldt University in Berlin. And um, almost four years ago, we were in the Brazilian Amazon to in a study region where we were interested in um, getting a better picture of uh, how the land is used after the tropical rainforest was removed. And in our study region, this is mainly uh, done for um, uh, implementing cattle pastures, and uh, we were interested in describing how these pastures are used, how they are managed by the farmers. Uh, in particular, we like to describe how often they get burned, as we see in the left image. and. Uh, how or when do they get used more intensively, like um, um, with, um, yeah, how often they get tilled, for example, where machines are used to manage the land. And um, so we collected a lot of data in the field, but only well on, on, on the regions where we got access to with our cars. And um, then we used um, we, we looked uh, in the time series data that was available to us. Um, and here we see an example from a Landsat time series, there are two sensors, Landsat 7, Landsat 8. And um, as you can see, there's a pasture in the middle um, that get, ma gets managed within steps of eight days of this time series. And you clearly see, for example here, that this pasture gets burned and a short while after it gets already tilled here. So the burning is not visible anymore. And um, to detect uh, these management events, we are, it is necessary to, um, to observe as many observations as possible. Um, we might have um, to, to clearly identify such events. And um, here we have an example with the cloud free time series, but of course, tropical Amazon, uh, tropical region, a lot of cloud coverage, especially during the rain season. And um, so we, uh, to, uh, to describe these management forms, we need to um, yeah, investigate a lot of time to, to uh, browse through our um, available data. And um, why do we need to do it by our own? Because because before we can start a kind of artificial intelligence, we need to train it, and for this training, we need to um, we need to uh, um, find um, reference examples that we can use for calibration of machine learning models, but also um, for validation of our mapping results. And so we had, starting with our work with our analysis, we had a lot of um, raster images, mainly from the Landsat uh, sensors, but also images with uh, better spatial um, resolution, but worse temporal coverage and also some worse um, spatial coverage for us. Um, so raster images coming from different sensors. 
but also vector information like GPS positions from our field trip, um, official deforestation maps, land use maps, and administrative units, which we like to use to get a better picture of what happens on ground. And of course, other that kinds of data like the pictures, camera pictures made in and field and by colleagues and so on, personal notes. So overall, we have the problem that we like to use all the data that is available for the visual interpretation of what happens on ground. And, but this is, became quite challenging because we have data of different data types, sensors, resolutions, and so on. So we had a look on which solutions exist to visualize these types of data. And, um, uh, we had the feeling that um, there are many specific um, solutions to visualize specific data and uh, specific sensor data, and they all have um, nice features and advantages, but on the other hand, they also missed some features. So basically, we, can, we would say that there are um, remote sensing specific applications which are very good in um, yeah, considering something like a raster image time series data, um, they have a concept of time series. They allow to visualize um, maps side by side, spatial maps side by side. They have something like a spatial profile, which gives us the um, band information per pixel, but also temporal profiles. And some of them also are able to um, handle virtual raster formats, which allow us to reorganize the data without the need uh, to um, writing images physically. Um, but they, are, they also have some limitations, and um, so we would say that the um, software from the traditional GIS context, geographic information systems, have also advantages which we often miss in these more traditional remote sensing applications. So we had the goal to have, or the, more or less the requirement to have an, an graphical user interface that allows for an integrated and interactive visualization of all these different um, dimensions that we have on Russia data time series, um, which allows us to use it in a more generic context to add data from different sensors, uh, maybe not only sensors, also products that we generate by our own which uh, can handle different resolution, spatial extents, and coordinate systems, and support a wide range of data, not only for raster, but also for vector data. And um, we like, in general, we like to have a, a better usability in terms of when we like to visualize this large amount of data, um, we do not want to spend much time on clicking and changing mouse clicks and uh, can we do it? So we like to have kind of easy adjustment of visualization settings. And, uh, and of course, lessons learned in the field work, um, we like to have a tool that we can use offline, where we don't have any internet connection or, um, yeah, but where we like to see our time series data to um, make decisions in field, for example, to find a better road to go to another point of interest. So we spent some time, and, or a lot of time, and created um, an own graphic user interface, which we call now the EO Time Series Viewer. Um, it has basically consists of uh, three components, uh, um, a spatial uh, representation, which provides you the data as common spatial maps, like you know from every GIS, geographic information system, but also a temporal uh, our representation visualization of um, the time series as profile, per pixel profile, and um, a common spectral profile, or pixel profile visualization. And these components interact together. Um, right, it's, um, it became an official QGIS 3 plugin. QGIS, if you never heard about it, it's probably the most common open source geographic information system. Um, it's programmed in Python, uh, it's free and open source. Uh, it uh, uses um, the Qt uh, and QGIS API and uh, GDAL as for Russia I.O. Um, how to start? You open the application and then you add your Rasta images. Um, 
as long as they can be read by GDAL, so GDAL supports more than 150 formats, as I know, raster formats, and, um, and as long as the single raster image provides something that you can interpret as a timestamp, it will be added to the multi-sensor time series inside the time series viewer, um, which you see here. So we have some example images from the example data. Um, these images can have different spatial extents, different um, uh, coordinate reference systems, and so on. They will be added. And um, automatically, we align each image to a kind of sensor or type of product, which consists of a fixed number of bands and a certain pixel size, and meters, for example, or and if optionally given, the wavelengths per band. And images that relate to the same sensor can be handled in the same way for visualization, for example. Um, yeah, this is a short animation how this happens. So we add data, then this um, list fills up with the um, uh, with a list of um, raster images. We can change the name of our sensors. And this name change appears in different places of the graphical user interface. And um, this allows us to optimize what you see now, um, to uh, optimize the band stretch for per sensor. So all images that relate to the same sensor, in this case, Rapid Eye or Landsat, um, will, be, uh, have, will, will get the same um, a band stretch or a color representation. And in this case, we show one row, or this, this row of images is um, ordered by time and sensor. And uh, in this case, this row gives us a true color representation. But if you like to, to have a second one, second uh, um, um, view on the, on the spectral space of our raster images, then we, we add a, a new map view. That's how we call it. And um, for example, like here, where we add a new map view, which provides us additionally the short wave infrared information stored in the data. So we can, for the visual interpretation of our data, we can have a look on, on two different uh, spectral regions at the same time. Um, this is shown here. And for each, again, for each per map, map view on the top and on the, on the bottom, for each you can adjust um, the, um, the, the color, the representation of the images. In this case, again, RGB colors for um, showing the values of three bands, but in general, you can apply each um, a render style that the QGIS API provides us. For example, you could also uh, show or visualize a, a time series of uh, classified images, for example, or single band images. Um, here we see the example for, for temporal profiles. You select a certain map tool and um, select a spatial position. And for this position, it will um, the time series where will retrieve the, the temporal data per band. And this allows you to not only per band, you, you can also specify three minutes left, OK, <laughs> or over. No. Um, you can specify the band or calculate a, a spectral index on the fly, and uh, the time series where allows you to compare temporal profiles between different positions or different sensors or different indices. So it's on you what you like to visualize. It gives you a lot of degrees of freedom. And finally, the visualization of standard spectral profiles prevent. Uh, you can select them in these different um, from these different observations, uh, you can compare them across sensors and um, export them as a spectral library as well to store them and use them in another context. This was the visualization part, but later on we want to use these our exemplary data for for um, parameterizing our machine learning models, for example. And um, for this, we is we. Um, so yeah, you want to identify and describe points or regions of interest, and for this we we use make use of the labeling capacities of QGIS, where you can create and edit vector geog geometries like a point uh, file or a polygons, and you can add as many attributes to describe these spatial regions. 
And to support this in a more temporal time or time series context, we provide some some yeah, nice context men menus that allow you to easily copy the temporal or time series specific uh, information like date, uh, the sensor name, and uh, day of year, and so on. Um, it is um, the, the entire project was developed side by side by other scientific words. So, so there are many to do's. We are not professional programmers, but uh, we like we need some tools that support our, our work. So um, there are many uh, features that we want to implement in future and um, and things we have to solve. Uh, there's a lot of bug fixing, of course, but um, and, and many things could be done easier and, and faster. So uh, many improvements are on, on our to-do list. Uh, take home message, EO time series viewer, uh, it, it helps you to visualize your file-based raster data as it is. You do not need to um, retransform it just for the purpose of visualization. It um, gives you an interactive view on spatial, spectral, and temporal data dimensions in the raster time series. It supports you to in labeling the reference data and to extract label information. And it is a free and open source QGIS plugin. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, is there any question? We're a bit over time, but I think we have one question. Yep, and uh, there we go. This looked that you worked on small parts of the images, but I guess you have always the full image at hand. Or is there any limitations in space? Um, the, no, I, I, I haven't tested it in a very big data context, but it's, um, I don't have uh, problems to load images of standard um, tile size, like normal Landsat footprints and so on. And we, the plan is to uh, enhance this to to even cover larger areas. But of course, um, as, we, as there is no optimization for the big data case, it might need some time to load the data. But um, we use standard QGIS API functionality for this, so if they load the data faster, then we, this time series we will benefit from. Okay, um, now it's Carsten Brockmann up on stage. And thanks again. Um, Benjamin. Okay. With uh, visualization and analysis of climate data in the ASA CCI climate analysis tooling environment. Well, it's a long title. Yep. <laughs> Pretty good. There is my and actually, there was a roundtable scheduled. If you look at the schedule, there was a roundtable scheduled to be happening at the same time in the same room with the same people. So we can just do one. So it will be Carson's presentation. Um, Right. All right, so I chose a long title that I have time to prepare it, but I was not fast enough. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the session. I got a lot of inspiration also for our work on the CCI toolbox. A uh, lot of points to link with and nice people who I never saw before, so that's really great. This is work done by quite a number of people who are listed here. Um, I know that I'm an ESAN, but still I think it might be worth to introduce to the not so um, familiar people with the CCI the, uh, program, uh, because these are the data we are working with primarily. That is the ESA Climate Change Initiative, uh, which is a 140 million euro R&D program starting in 2010 and still running until 2024, uh, which aims at exploiting the full potential of Earth observation data to support climate research and assessment. Um, there are in the past, the uh, first um, years were 16 projects running, engaging more than 300 scientists from more than 100 organizations out of 18 countries. And this is really the aiming to produce a long time series of what is called essential climate variables, ECVs. So this covers ocean data um, like sea level, sea state, ocean color, salinity, atmospheric data, aerosols, greenhouse gases. Um, from the um, land biosphere, there is um, biomass, land cover, um, fire burned areas, snow, permafrost. So it's, it's really addressing a large number of essential climate variables 
which are necessary to, um, to study um, the, uh, our environment under climate aspects. So there were 14 of these so-called essential climate variables ECV studied during the first years uh, and currently in, in this phase CCI plus there is another nine ECVs being studied. And ECV is not just one variable, it's typically one uh, family of variables. So it is a big archive of data which is under development and a large data set has already been compiled. Um, status last month, there were the 14 um, ECVs of the first phase um, organized in the archive, which is over 100 data sets with 4.2 million files and 133 terabytes of data. And the additional nine ECVs are underway and um, complete their first year pretty soon, and then they will populate. This data center, which is hosted at Jasmine in the UK, um, and there is a large activity to manage these data at their scale in a consistent way to allow scientists to draw conclusions from this. So <clears throat> this data is available through the CCI Open Data Portal, which is a single point of access to these ESA climate data. It is open, free, and easy. It's pretty much in the, uh, uh, in the idea of, of the Copernicus data, but it, it's CCI. Um, so this Open Data Portal provides access through uh, traditional ways like an FTP, a CCI viewer, you can search on the data. There is a dashboard where you can see which, which time scales are covered because for climate data you need long time records. And these time records, these 133 terabytes, go back to the 1980s and then up to current. So it's also long time series data that you can see in the dashboard. So <clears throat> to put now the toolbox in this context, we have what I just briefly explained the essential climate variables. Um, there is the open data portal, which makes it in the traditional way available, let's say on, okay, uh, restart required for this computer. <laughs> Okay, um, the open data portal with, with the access data. And then we have the ESA CCI toolbox called CATE, um, Climate Assessment Tooling Environment, which is um, combining these data in a common data model and make it accessible for scientists to, to do their analysis and to visualize it and to process these data. The common data model is, in, is uh, so far important because these ECVs are generated in a way which is optimized for their individual data set. Glacier data or vector data, um, some data they come on an annual basis or even um, more, less frequently like land cover data, other data come more on daily base. They are on different spatial scales which is all optimized for their individual purpose. But if you want to work with this, you need to have it under your fingertips in one common data model. And actually, we are not just um, making in this common data model available the CCI data, but also other data which should be climate related. Most importantly, local file that the scientist brings um, from his own measurements with it, um, but also other climate data from the climate SAF or um, becoming more and more important from the Copernicus Climate Service, um, the C3S data. Um, the basic is that this should be net CDF, CF convention compatible data. So in the CCI toolbox, actually, we work like this. Um, we, in, we, we work pretty much in a distributed environment. We have a, we have a core API, which is implemented in Python and which has a total um, implemented plugin architecture that all the different modules can be can be added. This is the back background which is working on the data, and this is um, exposed to the user interfaces via a web service. And as user interfaces, we have a desktop application for interactive working with it. We have a command line interface, and of course, you can directly include um, the functions of the core API in your own Python applications. And because this is all managed via the web service, you can, uh, oh, one can decouple the user interfaces from the actual processing engine, the Python core API, so that one thing can be run where the data is and the other can, can run distributed. But actually you can also run the whole thing on your, on your laptop if you, if you want. There is a small um, Python web service being started. So I talk a little bit more about how, how you can work with this because we're in the visualization uh, session. I, I stress the, the K desktop, but 
you will see that this goes oops that this goes seamlessly with the IP, API and the and the command line interface. So this is how K Desktop looks like. I will explain it a bit further. You have the globe as a globe in the center, and then you have some panels on the left and the right. And these panels on the left and the right, they are um, structured like this. The data source is quite important, as you have seen. There is um, the starting point are the ESA CCI data, which is really a huge amount of data. Then there are operations, which are then um, used to perform, as it says, operations on these data. And there is a workspace on the right side where you collect the data that you generate by um, applying operations. Um, uh, so, or you add other data like, like ground control points or whatever. Um, to work with these data. In the middle uh, panel, there is the visualization. So this is a little bit the, the layout of the K-Desktop. <clears throat> um, and as I said, the link to the data is really one key. Um, as you have seen, there, there is this rich data, um, amount of data. And with the, with, the, um, with the upper left panel, you can browse through the um, CCI open data portal. It connects to the portal and gives you um, very handy um, information, what are these data, there is metadata information, abstract of the data content, all the variables which are listed for one ECV, right? For the sea level, you have the, the, you have the sea level trend, you have the mean sea level, amplitude phase, so there is a lot of physical variables. And with this user interface, it explains to you, it, it is searchable. So, and from this, you can select quite quickly what you want to have. Um, you can do a temporal subsetting, spatial subsetting, and, and variable subsetting to select just the data that you want to work with. Right. So this was very theoretically, and I want to go just with one example together with you. Um, how, how does it work? So and let's look at sea level rise, which is probably somehow known to most of us. Um, so and it starts with the selection of the data um, on the Okay, yes, uh, here is the pointer. So with the selection here, I, as I said, I go to the open data portal. I can configure other data sources here. And then I, I get my sea level data here. I can read as I explain temporal coverage and so on. Uh, this is mean sea level and this is, I think, the changes, the trends. Um, I open them and then I can visualize them. This is the amplitude and we can see here that we have in the Gulf Stream area um, the height um, of the sea level and this is the sea level trend. So the change over, um, over the years which is, which is also most importantly here in the area of the, um, of the Gulf Stream. And this globe you can rotate. I didn't dare to, uh, to bring a, uh, my laptop here, so you can rotate, you can um, change the visualization panel here with the color scale and all the things you, you want to do. You can also change the map representation from the globe to a more traditional map view and, and compare the two on, on the global map. Or you can have this um, slider where you can move back and forth and then and, and, and see how these two variables correlate. And actually this correlation is one thing that you want to study scientifically. So then we come to the um, to the operators, and one of the uh, you can just type here what you want to do, and then it shows you what kind of operators it has to to do this. So if you want to do a scatter plot between these two variables, you type scatter. You get a, a brief description of what it's doing. If this is right, yes. Then you say add step, and it comes with the uh, with the user interface where you select from the sea level trend, the trend variable, the amplitude from the sea level data set. Um, as I said, we have always the full time series here, so I just pick the first time step from this, and I can add the step and execute it, and then I can get, a, and then I get in the visualization panel. Here was my world map, here my scatter plot, the two dimensional scatter plot where I can zoom and change the color scale, and this tells me that I have the largest trend here of about four millimeter per year for um, amplitudes which are about 0 0.1 meter for those heights with this. Um, with this level where probably you are in the area of the Gulf Stream. Um, three minutes, that's okay. So we have um, here the, the three steps I did. I opened two data sets and then I did the scatter plot. And as I said, we have the three interfaces um, and these steps which I did here on my work, um, workspace, I can copy um, the Python script, I can get it here, can put into my notebook or my, my IDE, and then go, go on from this and, and do whatever I want. It's just three calls. Everything is, is recorded in this way. 
A second example is land cover in Nigeria, totally different example. I have the land cover data set from the CCI data. I'm interested just in Nigeria. I want to see how the urbanization is taking place. So I loaded a shape file with the uh, uh, boundaries of Nigeria, cut it out by a subsetting operator, and then I wrote this little script where I count, where I have the class, the urban classes, uh, and then I just um, wrote here the urban growth percent. This is a script editor in, in, in uh, Kate Desktop. Is the bare land um, divided by the total count. I don't, I don't know, it's the urban, sorry. It's the urban count. And then I can see here, if I do the, the plot of this, um, how this is increasing in Ni Nigeria. So this is also with just three or four lines of uh, script I can do there. As I showed, um, Kate is split into the user interfaces and the back end, and this is the scenario I just showed you. That if, I, if you run all this on your, on your laptop, uh, in one environment, we have the Python core, we have the CCI data, which is actually remote, and then the Kate application, which is running. But this can be split that we have the Kate core, where is the data, and I have the Kate application on my um, desktop, but I can even split it further because the Kate application can run on a server and, con and, and talk through the internet with the Kate core, get the data, and I can run, actually what I do in Kate desktop, I can also run currently theoretically in a browser because we implemented it with Electron, which is bringing the web technologies to desktop applications. So we also take care of the community. Um, everything is actually open and we have read the docs which is always linked to the code so that you get the latest information about it. Um, this is where you find the latest um, installers. This is the currently development snapshot. There is always a stable version and then um, the development snapshots you can find here including the source code behind René. Um, for those who sit in front, yep, it's here. Uh, and then we have um, the web page which gives you a bit more information. There are videos that uh, explain with a bit more detail how to do it. So I also thought it might be good to, to tell a few lessons learned and generalizing statements. Integrating various data sources in a common data model significantly eases the thematic work on climate data issues. The state of the art GUI technologies, as I said, we're using Electron, bring the power of web development to processing intensive desktop application, but also paving the way to expose it in the web. And then open source software and easy to use plugin interfaces, as I explained in the beginning, all these operators are plugins and users can write it themselves and just drop it into the right directory. And the scripting capabilities allow scientists to easily extend Kate. So, um, I mean, I'm really um, enthusiastic to add uh, AI functionalities uh, after coming from this conference back home. And um, also what we are discussing is to, we can use Kate on top of data cubes because we also have there the three-dimensional and plus um, time-dimensional data set. So there is a lot of um, evolution that is possible based on this technology. And with this, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Carson. Any questions from the audience? There's one in the front. And by the way, pretty impressive uh, build with Electron. It's like, might, might be the most impressive Electron app I have seen so far. Well, looks pretty good. All right, your question. Yeah, thanks, Carsten. Uh, very interesting. And on uh, one slide, you showed that you can uh, open your, from your local uh, disk data. Yeah. And at the last slide, you showed that you uh, will want to support data cubes. Does that mean I can have uh, Sentinel and Lancet data in this toolbox and use all the operators on that? Or is it for climate researchers only? No, um, no, no, it's not for climate researchers. I mean, if uh, the, the idea, what, what the software is, is expecting is a, is a three or four dimensional data set. So if you, it's not really